Well, the events of this past week have affected me. I don't know if they're affecting you. The constant barrage of terrorist events in our world. Last night, my child had to come tell me what had happened in London. I have family in London. My wife's family live there. I've been on London Bridge and in Borough Market. I have been in those places, and each time something like this happens, it feels like it affects me personally. And it should. It should affect us. It should make us think about what's happening in the world, especially in the light of all else that's going on. What looks like a lack of leadership when we say the earth matters not when we say the only thing that matters is the almighty dollar we are in some serious trouble now i know in january i said to you we're going to be all right <laughs> and i said to you we're going to be all right because we're not going to stop we're not going to sit down, we're not going to step back, we're going to step out, and we have, and we are, and we will. But today I want to preach about Sabbath, and Sabbath is the actually exact opposite to stepping out. It is stepping back. It is stopping in the face of the need of action. It is almost a Taoist response to something. The Taoists say, if someone lunges at you, you recoil. <laughs> that the opposite reaction is often the best action. And I think about Sabbath in these terms and times that are of struggle. We want to go do something. We want to make change. We want to go stand out on a corner. We want to tweet and Facebook and <laughs> yell around about all the things that are going on. But the ancient notion of Sabbath actually asks us to do the opposite. It asks us to step back. I've learned a lot about Sabbath, and I've been preaching about Sabbath for some reason. So ever since seminary, I have thought Sabbath, that stepping back, is an essential part to my spiritual life. The seed planted when I lived in Israel... Because in Israel, on Friday, as the sun is going down, every single shop, everybody stops what they're doing and goes home. The Sabbath begins. The ancient notion in Leviticus or even in Genesis that the world was created in six days and on the seventh day God rested. I don't know how that happens. But that notion was absorbed into Judaism so deeply that the Sabbath holds a, an important place. That no matter what is happening, no matter what war, what struggle, what illness, one steps back on the Sabbath night. And there are meals of joy. The candles are lit. I used to watch my Jewish grandmother on Friday night alone in the kitchen lighting the Sabbath candles without fail as her little worship to that stepping back even for a moment. In Israel, we would work all week in the field. So I lived in the desert and we farmed in the desert. We turned the desert into green farms. And I would drive out in the mornings in the tractor, my John Deere tractor with an air conditioner and a radio listening to the BBC. And I'd drive past Gazelle from the, the uh, desert and go out and pull lines and irrigation all, all day and then come back. And on Friday, we put away all the equipment. We joined families. Families came together. They stopped work. And on Saturday, it was a day of play. The Sabbath meant something, even in those places where I was that weren't orthodox. The orthodox take it even to another degree. They don't even tear the, the toilet paper for fear that God would say you're working. <laughs> but on the Sabbath, we step back. 
And that's what I want to talk to you today about. Because the old adage is true that we must take time before time takes us. Even in the face of struggles. And we, Americans, aren't very good at this. We like 24-7 email, tweets from presidents at 3 in the morning, work demands, busy lives. We, we wear busyness as a badge. Sunday morning, however, is almost like a Sabbath. Some of you slow down, although I know some of you are going back to work after this. For me, the Sabbath is Thursday at sundown to Friday at sundown because I work on Sunday morning. And I try to preserve that time even out of sync with the rest of the world. Sunday is a work day. My family suffers that because they are not off. Or they are off and I am not. Even though I'm not so sure my teenagers really want to spend time with me. I try to preserve that Thursday evening through Friday to do nothing. The Sabbath is important. In Joshua Heschel's masterpiece called The Sabbath, one of my favorite books ever, he described creating space for the holy. He says, we know what to do with space, to fill it, to occupy it, to manipulate it. But we don't know what to do about time except to make it subservient to space. So he says, spiritual life, and I quote, begins to decay when we fail to sense the grandeur of what is eternal in time. He says, the Sabbath honors the grandeur of time. It is not a function of things and space. It is setting aside time. It is a participation in creation. He says, to participate in a Sabbath, whatever it is you can call Sabbath, is to participate in the presence of God. The presence of God in the world of space. That's lofty stuff, but important. The bottom line is, the Sabbath is important. And somehow our church, which often tempts to live in the realm of God rather than obey the rules of humanity, has preserved a gift that honors the Sabbath, and it is called sabbatical. (laughs) For every year a minister serves the church, a month is set aside for the minister to do whatever he or she wants to do with it. The months stack up until there are six. Sometimes the minister takes this time sooner and sometimes not, but the time is set aside. It is a gift to help a minister renew, re-glue, realign, relearn, rebound, or all kinds of re's you could think of. The gift is unfettered. Sabbatical is given with no expectation Now, typically the conversation about sabbatical is that it's either for time for rest or it's time to do something. But in the realm of the holy, the answer is it is truly time to do both. Sometimes congregants get grumpy and say, well, we don't get a sabbatical. Why should they? The realm of the holy says, them's the breaks. Ministers are rich in time, if not in cash. (laughs) Sometimes a congregant says, didn't he just go on sabbatical? (laughs) The rules of man say he has taken only three months of sabbatical in ten years of service. He is taking six, which equals nine, which means leaving one month on the table. (laughs) So there. (laughs) For the minister, the benefits are great in sabbatical. It is time of growth. 
It is time of rest. It is time to do whatever he or she wants to do. It is also a benefit to the congregation. The benefits to the minister are apparent. Time to renew. For the congregations, the benefit is great. The congregation can discover leadership skills and assume more responsibility for the church's future. One congregant in an article on sabbaticals said, I feel we, the congregation, benefited by this experience as much as the minister did. We had to make decisions based on meaningful discussions and not just by looking to our pastor to tell us the answer. He returned with revived enthusiasm in every aspect of his role. The congregation feels renewed energy. So why am I telling you this? (laughs) I leave on sabbatical in 11 days (laughs) for the rest of the year. (laughs) I'm taking two weeks vacation and then sabbatical. I am moving my family to Brookline, Massachusetts. I am going to be the resident fellow at Harvard Divinity School, which sums up to not so much, but a lot of freedom to study and take classes in the Divinity School and in Harvard University to take part in the life of the students, especially the UU students preparing for the ministry, and to do whatever the heck I want to (laughs) do. I don't know the details yet, but I plan to keep you informed. I want to see how I can get better at being the CEO of this organization So the business school and the government school are of interest to me. I want to wash myself in a learning community and see what my response is. My children will go to public school for the fall semester. My wife will take her painting to a new studio, a new environment. We will travel some to Europe. Pray for us. We will be in England and France. And I will ride a bicycle. I knew you'd be disappointed if I didn't. I will ride from South Wales to Northern England with a buddy of mine there. I will probably spend a lot of time with my family who live in Massachusetts. Whether that's a good thing or not (laughs) is yet to be seen. I will pick some apples from the old trees in my parents' yard. I might do some projects with some nonprofits to see what they are dealing with. Again, the specifics are wide open. I might preach once or twice. I will definitely be selling my book, Faith for the Unbeliever. Stay tuned. Next week, we'll sell the book here. I might go to church. I might go to a temple. I might go to nothing at all. That's what I know so far. Sabbath. You, on the other hand, will have some ministers coming through. My friends Wayne and Kathleen and Ruth will come here and preach two Sundays in a row each and teach in between. Scott Cooper, a seminary student who came out of the pews of this church and is doing an internship in Sacramento, will come and do part-time ministry here with us to cover both some sabbatical time and some parental leave time. We have a triage for communicating with me. It's in the hands of Aaron and the board. Aaron will be acting CEO, senior minister, because I love and trust him. Beth will be his support when she isn't having her babies. I love them both. They will nurture you in these six months. Sabbath. And I will return I don't want to hear this question again. I know some of you are worried about that. I am coming back. We are coming back. Sabbath. Rest. It makes possible reflection that is genuine and thoughtful and deep. The fruits of God's promises to provide for the seventh year after six of work That is metaphor for all I have learned over the years in the ministry, which has been inspiring and often overwhelming, that to step back 
gives me perspective. It's like seeing your family when you're running so hard and finally you stop and look at them and realize how much they've grown up and changed and matured and that you are part of it. Sabbath. Of whatever any kind it is good for relationships, it will be good for Marianne and for me, two people who miss each other all the time while arranging schedules and driving here, there, and everywhere to support our children. We need time together. Relationships need time. Sabbath, it asks me what I can set down and what I can't. I will set down meetings and duties as your minister and preaching and teaching and responding to your needs and raising money and leading the institution until 2018. None of this is easy to leave. I will miss you terribly. I will miss the rhythms of the church, the meaningful work we do together, the future we envision and shape every day we walk in here. Here's what I want from you. No one leaves the church while I'm gone. (laughs) You can finish the campaign we're in, by the way, while I'm gone. (laughs) Don't let it go past the summer. The goal is to visit everyone we can. The goal is 10 million. We can do this. We're at seven and a half now. I will not be able to set down my parenting, which needs so much more attention than I've given it. Nor will I set down my identity as a minister or my deep activist concerns for our country and the world. I will set down temporarily my concerns about the state of Texas, but only temporarily, knowing that other states have their own problems. I will not be able to set down my responsibility to grow and to evolve or my responsibility to understand myself in the context of something larger than who I am. And all this is rather terrifying if you think it's easy, it's not. Like the Wendell Berry poem where the farmer sits down in the quiet and receives his fears. In the quiet, my fears come to meet me. In the contemplation of who I am, there is a fearful response of finding something I do not wish to find. Finding things I keep hidden from myself, mostly in my busyness. Sabbath. Time is the presence of God. It is a terrifying prospect, but it is a welcome invitation. We are taught to act, not to not act. We are taught to respond, not to step back. But I think we are understand ourselves as a part of creation when we slow down the timeline of our own lives. To be a witness to the marvel of the world becoming means we have to set time aside to observe it, to be present, to see each other clearly, to watch each other change and grow. Sometimes the world needs us to step back, and it's okay. Friends, the Sabbath is not just for me, it is for us. I will miss you. I love you. We have one more Sunday together before the Sabbath begins for me. And I hope you will be here to buy my book. (laughs) Amen and amen. (laughs) 